Uh, I'm going to talk about ECS architecture and ECS is, uh, <clears throat> you might mistakenly call it a design pattern, but it's not, it's an architectural pattern. And you may or may not have heard of it. If you haven't, if you don't do any game development, you probably have not heard of it. I've only seen it in game engines and I don't know that it's really a great architecture for anything else. Um, it's really simple and I'm gonna cover it in just a couple of minutes. And then if, you know, the, uh, uh, live demo powers allow it. I may even show show you how some of it it's done. So we'll start with what is it? Um, the ECS is entity component system. And it's a way of breaking out the data from your code in your game. And the reason that that's useful in a game engine is because every game kind of works with the same uh, the same behaviors. Once you have these these behaviors coded, any number of games can be written with the same thing. That's why game engines are so popular and it's so easy to build games with a game engine because the game engine already has all the systems that you're ever going to, you know, probably going to need at least plenty. So um, once the systems are made, they contain all the behaviors. All you have to do to make your game is deal with the entity and the component. And the entity and the component are mostly just data. So it makes it very easy to build a game when you don't have to worry about any of the system behaviors. So when will you use it? Uh, I'm using it because for Kids Code Camp on the 22nd of July, make sure you attend, tell all your friends. Uh, I've built a game in mono game, mostly, and I did it with an ECS architecture. So mono game is not a game uh, engine, it's a game framework. So it's for me to, I have to write the program. Uh, it's not like Unity where I can click around and write some scripts and the engine has all the stuff built into it. I have to build all that stuff. So in that case, ECS makes sense for me to, to use because I have to come up with some architecture. Might as well try this one. And uh, you may use it if you're using one of the game engines that's actually built around ECS. Now I find that uh, Unity 3D dots and Stride both use uh, ECS, but you wouldn't find on, if you go to the Stride website, you wouldn't see that it says it uses an ECS architecture. You would actually have to ask somebody or you would have to load it up and look at it and say, yeah, I think this looks like an ECS architecture. They, they don't broadcast this. So it's a little bit elusive. And as such, I don't really know. I don't, I don't have a great picture of what is out there that's using this. And so the popularity of it, even for me, I'm not really sh sure of, but uh, I know that I've used it and I know that I, I would probably use it again. I would do it a little differently because it's up to you kind of how you implement it, but uh, it's been good for this project. Um, other, pro other systems such as Unity 3D Dots, which is not the same as Unity 3D Classic, they're very clear about the fact that this is an ECS design. So let's talk about why I wanna use it. Uh, it's super scalable and uh, you know you can you can look down the list there it's it, it's mostly pro, mostly pros to using it as far as my experience goes the downsides I think you probably only um, I you know I listed as many as I could but none of these really were reasons to not choose an ECS um, the minor optimization to avoid excessive entity iteration is really easy to do and I, I sure didn't run into any problems with it with my meager game. Uh, if I were to build a, a AAA game, it, it would be a different matter, but it really it would be trivial, trivial to address those things. Um, we talked about what those parts, you know, about the three parts, but let's talk about what they are. So an entity, um, an entity really doesn't, isn't anything by itself except a collection of components. So, uh, I've put ID comma list of components in there, uh, but I, I don't know that you really need both. Uh, it Really, you probably want one or the other because all you're really trying to do is tie a collection of components to an entity. And so either your components could have an entity ID property so that they point to the entity or they could be added to the entity's list of components. Um, I, I you, you could have both, but I don't think that makes much sense. Uh, you could have an entity that is just an int ID and that's it. So the entity really is, it doesn't have any behaviors and it doesn't have a lot of data. The data is in the components. 
So talking about the components, um, each of the components will have a, a singular purpose. And so you might want two or three components in order to achieve a certain thing. So if, say for example, uh, I don't know if any of you have ever played, uh, well, I, pro probably any fighting game you've ever played or any RPG, you know, a lot of these games, it's very popular to have uh, a, an enemy be attacked. And then when you, when you hit them, it will detract from their hit points and you'll see a little number appear at their feet and kind of float up and then disappear as it approaches their head. And, and uh, so let's talk about that effect. You've got, you've got some text there, you've got some motion. So it moves from the bottom up and then you've got some, uh, a transition from solid to transparent probably, or something like that, or maybe it just disappears at the end, but let's say it, it's, you know, transitioning through transparency. That's three different behaviors that you want to attach to this entity. Uh, well, four, I think, maybe, did I count them right? <laughs> anyway, you have a number of them. And so each of those components would entail one or, or one of those behaviors. Uh, and the system implements it and the component declares it. So this declarative data in the component has to be grouped together to kind of define the whole thing. And that makes it very flexible. So if I want to add this behavior or remove that behavior, I just modify the properties on the component and then the system, which you might even think of as a game engine at that point just takes care of it. The stuff that I want to happen on the screen just magically appears. I don't have to babysit it. I don't have to check it each iteration of my game loop. It just happens once everything is set up. And then the system, I think the system is pretty easy to understand, but the system is where the code is. So the system will go and look through all the entities in the game and have a look at their components. And it's going to find the components that it knows how to deal with. So uh, a, a text rendering system will look for text components. And when it finds them, it'll say, what's your text property? And I'm going to render that to the, to the screen at the XY coordinates that the component says to render them. So if I wanna move that thing around the screen, I change the XY parameters of the component and the system puts it wherever I tell it. Questions? Great. So I, I don't know that this is the most readable chart, but uh, this is sort of how they relate. So up at the top, we have the game application and it has a list of entities and a list of systems. So I create an instance of every system up front and I put them where they need to be to be executed at every uh, iteration of the game loop. And then I have a list of entities that I can create and destroy throughout the game to make it do what I want. Each of those entities has a list of components or an ID that uh, 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 and it, that the components will reference either way. And then each of those components will each have their, their own behavior as I described before. So I've just got some examples over there on the left of the components and you'll see on the right, you've got a corresponding system. So one for the sprites up top, the next one down, you might, oh, well, they're not in order, I guess, but you'll have text, you'll have maybe tile maps and maybe a sprite animation. So here's an example of the code for a simple entity and component. So to draw text on the screen with a black box behind it so that it, so there's contrast and you can see it, that's almost exactly the code that I would use. So I create a new entity, I stick a component in it, and I create a second entity and stick the component in it. And then I uh, add those entities to my entity list so that they can be iterated by the systems later. So you may be looking at it thinking, well, why is this any better than the other stuff? Well, maybe a better example shows why. So if I have a singular entity with more than one component in it that does more interesting things, such as maybe I want the background to fade in and out uh, by affecting its transparency, I can declare this, uh, it, it's not motion, but uh, this sequential change on the properties just by declaring another component and sticking it in the same entity. Now I've got another system out there that will go and deal with that. And it almost looks like I'm, I've got my own for loop in there and a bunch of code in there to deal with it, but I don't have any of that stuff. It's all in the system. So I can create 20 of these just by instantiating an object and sticking it in the right place. 
So <clears throat> systems are, in my opinion, almost, almost as simple as entities. There's really not much to them. You're gonna have a list of entities, you're gonna for each your way through them and you're going to tell the system to process each one in a way that it knows how. So the code on the right is almost as simple as it is. And they're simple enough that we'll probably go through one. Uh, this one I actually took right out of one of my systems, a working system. So in the in the code there, you'll see the first thing it does is this bar components equals entities, and then it does some link stuff. Uh, that's a filter, and you'll find that in in the way that I've defined my structure, my data structures, and my my objects. You're always going to find this in my systems. So it'll go through all the entities and find the the components that it's familiar with, and this is what it looks like. So uh, the, the whole second half of that, starting with the sprite batch line, that's just how it draws it to the screen in mono game. So that may not even be a thing in, if you're using Pygame game or some other uh, framework or whatever else you're doing, that may not even be a thing. Uh, but you can see that there's a for loop, for, uh, sorry, a for each loop in there. And that's, we saw on the previous slide, that's the second part of this. And that's pretty much all there's gonna be in there. The filter and then the loop. I'll give you just a second to look at that. And if there are any questions, go ahead and blurt them out. So the snippet here is for only the text components, right? That's right. So I'll have a different system for components of a different type. Would you create a different draw for that system or would you just repeat what you have here in the draw? Well, you would have to have a different draw system because it, it has to do something different to put something else on the screen. For example, if I have a, uh, the second half of an, an example I had on a previous slide was I would put a text box, sorry, a, a black box behind my text to give it contrast so it's not hard to read against the background. So I would have a different draw method for that. Is that, is that the answer to your question? I'm asking if the draw method I'm seeing here is part of the system components that you were uh, creating like text component uh, renderer, or if this is the main mono game draw loop and you're gonna have to draw everything eventually in this loop. Ah, I see, that's a great question. The, what I've done is the systems have a draw loop, uh, sorry, a draw method of their own, and it gets called by the draw loop in the main game loop. Sorry, the draw, uh, it, it gets called in from the main game loop. So there's also an update method. And really, um, I, I took this example straight out of the file, like I said I did, but this is not the way that I'm doing it now. Uh, there's also an update method in the mono game uh, uh, framework. And in update, you really should do all of your calculation and pre-processing. And so the filter part where it says var components equals entities, et cetera, that wouldn't be in the draw method. That would be in the update method. And so if you're using mono game, you would find that, you know, there's, there's an update method and a draw method in, in the game loop. And so I just uh, mimic those in all of my stuff and call them from the main game loop. So this is not going to be in the, in the game one.cs file. This is in my system x.cs file. Does that make sense? Does that answer the question? It might be better yeah. to just look at the code in a minute. It does. I thumbs up it too. So. Oh, okay. Great. Anything else? All right. I, I have one question. Yes, go. So I was going to have take two of my grandkids to uh, kids code camp. Is this, um, is this code? Cause it seems a little complicated for a younger kid to use. Um, sure. Yeah. This can, can you explain, are you, are you going to really be talking about this kind of stuff or. Well, the way that I, the way that it works is we have several classes, several sessions, and this one is geared for the older kids and okay. probably kids that have some programming experience, but no, I wouldn't be talking about this particular topic. Uh, I will be showing them I, what I'm going to do is this game that I'm working on is pretty big and okay. we couldn't possibly cover the whole thing in one class. So I'm going to take sections of it okay. and I'll make them the simpler sections. So if you have an older child, uh, at least probably 12 years old, okay. uh, and they took this class, they wouldn't be dealing with any, any of this particularly complex stuff. I would be dealing with, uh, 
they probably go and create the, the components, but I wouldn't explain to them how they work or why, or why they're doing it that way. Uh, we would probably just be taking some of the code where they read the keyboard and then take some action by moving the character to the left, for example, simpler okay. stuff. Okay. Uh, but we do have, like I said, if, if, if the kids are younger or if, if they're just on a different level, um, we have kit, we have stuff that's suitable for kids five and five and up. And really okay. the five-year-olds can do that stuff. So okay. Nate's, Nate's done that quite a bit and they're really successful with the younger kids. Okay. Do you want to add anything, Nate? Uh, yeah. On the website, it says the mono game one you're talking about here is 14 plus, but yeah, that sounds oh, okay. better. And this okay, is yeah. more in the advanced track, but yeah, I mean, obviously this is going to be a more in-depth topic and advanced topic than something we would cover with kids. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Great. Okay. Uh, component association is, it, it is a, a circumstance that needs to be dealt with when, for example, in the example I gave where your hit points are being displayed uh, in, in a rising fashion on your screen, you have three or four different components that all work together to make that happen. And what do you do if you have, uh, you know, not just a simple text component where it has everything that it needs, but you need two or three components to all kind of work on the same, uh, uh, the same task. So the, the alpha fading component will need to know about the text component and which properties to write to and that sort of thing. The X, uh, oh, sorry, the, the uh, Y position of the text is going to have to move. So if there's a component for that, it needs to know about the text component. And so there's going to have to be some association for these things to work together. And there are two ways that people seem to be solving this. And I'll talk about what those are. So the archetypes approach, um, I, I explored this. I thought this was a great way to go. And I changed my mind hard and fast. Uh, it, it seemed to me like it breaks all of the benefits of having ECS and frankly, all of the uh, rules for object-oriented programming in general too. It just seemed like a bad idea. So I have them in the slides here, but I'm not using this. I'm using the grouping and I have no complaints at all. I, it works great. It was easy. It's simpler to understand. And it, I, I just couldn't sell it. I couldn't sell archetypes after having tried them both. Um, but archetypes means that you're going to have some known combinations of components that work together for a, a combined behavior. And I can get them to do what I want without doing that at all. It's more flexible and less tightly coupled, and it was easier to code. Um, once, once the archetypes are done, they might be easier to deal with, but it was a lot of coding to produce a bunch of them that I wanted, and I didn't have to do any of that with grouping. So I'll, I, I'll show you some samples here of kind of what they're supposed to look like. Uh, this is not a, a good implementation of an archetype, but it kind of shows the idea behind it. So if I have an, an entity, I would have some properties for a particular archetype. And so I know that an animated text behavior is going to need these two types of components. And so for that archetype, I'm going to have a way to put those two components on that entity. So in this simple example, I just have a property for each one. And then if I want a different archetype, I have, have to have a, a way to attach that to the entity as well in the same fashion. And so every entity needs to be able to support every archetype. And so you have to you know, refactor your code a little bit and make it reasonable, but it would still end up looking something like this. So I would have an archetype type so that whoever's dealing with the archetype can find it and know that it's their responsibility to deal with it. And then I would have the component list, of course. But uh, in the component list, I'm going to have to add components of those known types. And how do I know what those types are? You know, I, I really, as a, I really just as a programmer have to know those things and be careful and not screw it up. Well, that's, you know, I, I, I learned early on in my career to try and avoid situations like that. Let the compiler do the work for you. Let it catch your problems. And this subverts all of that. There's no, no way for the systems to do that without you really nailing everything down and restricting yourself. And this is the better way to do them. So I was not a fan. Um, I've seen a couple of other ways too that people have described and they were worse, really terrible, terrible things. So here's grouping. And so in grouping, 
we already described what that entity is going to look like. So we have this component list and that's all I have on there. And then if I want to add an archetype, I have two uh, components that are required for this animated text. So the first thing I do is create the text element itself. And you can see that I've got this ID and I just hard coded 24601. In reality, my components just create a, a GUID on construction. And I don't care what that ID is as long as it's unique. I don't even need it to be globally unique. I just need it to be unique within the entity. So I've defined it there and I set the text property there too. And then for the second component, I just need it to know something about the text component. So I have a target property on there and I assign it the text component.id. And so that gives it that association that it needs. And now there's no problem. It's, it's solved as simple as that. And really it does work. So I wouldn't recommend doing it any other way myself. Maybe somebody who's got more experience with it would say otherwise and I would listen, but uh, I sure, can, sure have no complaints. Oh, and that's it. So uh, I didn't expect this to be long, but uh, why don't we look at some code and maybe that will answer some questions or make some new questions. Uh, this is a bit of a mess and it's really small. So let's start with more of that. Okay, so I have, um, well, let's just, let's just kind of see the game first so that you kind of know what the code is supposed to be doing. So I know it's a tiny window, but here it says continue new game and quit. And I'll just press the button to continue and it actually creates a new game. But this is a neutered version of it because most of what's going on in here is either buggy or not finished. But uh, I just have this, uh, this little scene, this guy can walk around and that's just about all this version does. So you can see that I have a couple of different systems going on and a couple of different components and different entities. So the first thing you'll see is I've got this background and that's a tile map component in, a t in an entity. And there's a tile map renderer system that draws it on the screen for me. So it has a property uh, called um, uh, viewport. And the viewport says that well, let me see here. So, so here's the tile map and you can see right in this space right here, maybe if it's not too small, it's only showing me this part of the map. So I define this viewport and tell it in my component that the viewport is just this square area here. And so that's what it's going to put on the screen. Next I have, that's distracting. Next I have this little dude here and he's gonna stay in the center of the screen and the, screen, the map will move around behind him. But while he's moving, He's animated. You can barely see it, but his hands and his feet are moving. So I have this sprite component, and then I have a sprite animator component. And so those guys are all being run by systems 60 times a second and drawn on the screen by the systems. So uh, we can take a look at what those look like because they're all this, this whole, you know, when I first started it, it's, it starts up in the, uh, uh, type in the title screen here. So this is an unrelated concept, but uh, I've created scenes. So there are different scenes in the game and I can switch between, you know, you might you think of them as like sub games or something. So this whole thing is currently the only guy that accepts keyboard input or mouse input or draws on the screen. And so when I take certain action, he switches to a whole different scene. And then this scene now gets the keyboard input and the mouse input and the control of the graphics. So in this scene, the whole thing Everything that you're seeing it do is in the overworld scene. And this guy is still in my way. Okay, so in the overworld scene, I have uh, a constructor here and he takes some stuff that he needs to do his job. And just ignore the commented lines, but we have, uh, up here, I have a list of entities and that is what I'm going to feed to the systems. But I also have my entities and that's a little different. That's just for me to reference them so that I can change their properties when keyboard inputs dictate. And 
down here, I go and create them. So here's a, a sprite component. And I create it, set its properties, and then I use this entity.from. And I pass, I, I just give it a name for debug purposes so I can see that in my uh, in my IDE when I'm debugging. And then I pass it the component. And then I pass it the uh, the animator component. So these two guys work in tandem in a single entity. And they don't need any grouping because there's an inherent shortcut here where just because the player sprite animator uh, sorry, the sprite animation component, he knows that he's going to be animating a sprite component. He just knows that it's his purpose in life. He doesn't, there's no mystery. So he only, he, he can look in the entity and find the other sprite component, the, the system that's, uh, that's processing this guy. He knows it too. He can go and find the sprite component as long as it's the only one in the entity, he doesn't care. He doesn't have to have any special knowledge about, um, uh, which one? Because there's only one, if that makes sense. So I'm not using any grouping in this pair. Now, I have, um, I had, I had some trouble getting the the thing to do what I wanted because these games are particularly hard to debug for a couple of reasons. One, uh, everything that's going wrong is going wrong 60 times a second, and it's hard to nail down what you're seeing. Uh, sometimes because you're not always seeing everything that's going on. <clears throat> And they don't output to a console window all the time. There, you have to do a special setup to do that. And I can do that, that's nice. Uh, you can output to the uh, one of these output windows. That's really easy to do, but it's not timely. It takes like a quarter of a second or half a second for that thing to show up in the list. So I wanted to add uh, a text label to the screen so that I could out, output some debug stuff. And it was really, really useful and I recommend doing it. So I'm going to just put these, oh, not those, these. So I'm just gonna turn on debug and I'll create a debug text component right here. I'm gonna complain because I'm still running. Okay. and. So that component by itself doesn't do anything until we put it in an entity. So I'm gonna add that entity and I'll put that in my list so that it gets processed. So I think that will run. Let's try it. Yeah, so here's my text and it, it tells me everything I need to know and it's very useful, but it's kind of hard to see. So I wanted to put a black box behind it so that I could see it. And I've talked about that in my slideshow because that was a real life example. So I'll go do that here. So here's my new color box. And I needed to create a new system for that. I had a text system for the title screen and you know a couple of other things already, but I had to create a special one just for this. And it was really simple to do. So it, I just thought I'd go ahead and do it. And let's take a look at what that system looks like. So uh, in my systems folder, I have color box system. And it could even be simpler than this, but I have a cache in here. So I have uh, pixels is a cache. Uh, because I have to go and create this texture for the black box. And I don't want to do it on every frame. I want to do it just once and hold on to it. So, you know, in, uh, I don't know if there's a constructor here. Yeah, there's the constructor. So I create a cache here. And then I have this method to go and pull it, pull a color out of the cache. And if it doesn't exist, it creates it. So no, no mysteries here. It just, uh, does a try get value and with an out texture 2D and returns it here. So in draw, I go and I do my filter, just like we talked about before. And I get a color box component entity pair out of it. And then I have my sprite batch. So I do a new sprite batch, sprite batch begin. There's my for each and my sprite batch end. So create pixel will go and pull it out of the cache 
and it'll draw it at this rectangle. And color white is deceiving. That's That does some color mixing. Color white basically just means don't do any fancy trickery, but that's not actually the color it's going to be. The color comes from here. And if I say it's blue, it'll be blue, even though this says white. That's just a mono game thing. Don't worry about that. So Nate was asking about this being the draw method for the game. You can see that this is just the draw method for the system. And the systems are drawn in, um, oh, I keep forgetting where it is. And it's my previous search results. So you can see, I'm not kidding. Uh, it's in game creator. So here are my systems that I've created and each one is registered. And these are the ones that are going to be iterated to process the components. So I created a new color box system and when I call the systems registry and, and for each so through those things, I'm going to call the draw method on the, first the update method and then the draw method on that. And each one of those guys get called on the draw method. Oh, well, not this draw method. Uh, this guy has his own draw method and his own update method. And each one of those get called from the main game loop. So here, it, that's initialized. Let's find update. Update is here. So the system service will call update on all of the services. And then it'll call, this is my own method called tick. And it's it's for different purpose. I won't go into that. I'll just, it's not relevant. And then down at the bottom, we call the scene controller dot update. And the scene controller knows that the or world scene is a current scene and he calls and he just passes the update. And same thing down here in draw. We have the draw all and then he goes through and for all of the systems calls their draw method. Okay, so here in the overworld scene, um, let's go back to what I was doing up here. And we have the color box and we'll add that to an entity and then add the entity to the list And now I have this black banner behind my text so I can read it a little easier. So it was pretty easy to do that. I don't have to go into the game loop and, and mash it in with all of the other stuff that's getting drawn all the time. I just create a component and put it in the list. And uh, the rendering just goes off by itself. It's like delegating a task and you can trust the guys to get it done. So I so really had a good only, time with it. Go how do you handle Z ordering in this? I, is the only uh, reason that the uh, the background painted and then the text on top of it is it because its system was registered first? That is a great question. And I was really hoping somebody would ask that. So there is, that is going to be an inherent problem in ECS. And I don't know all of the great ways to solve it. I know that it's not a problem in mono game because mono game has a built in depth knowledge. So if I say, um, Oh, uh, let's go to um, color box system. You see that float layer depth parameter? It's the last parameter. I can tell it in any order to draw this box or that box at a different layer depth and it's going to put them in that Z order for me. It's just magically capable of doing that. So my ECS system has no ability to manage that other than the red, the order of systems registration, but mono game handles it for me. So if I'm not using mono game, if I were using Pi game, for example, I would have to deal with that because I don't know of anything that Pi game has built in to deal with that. So, uh, I haven't put a lot of thought into how to, how to deal with that, but I have put enough into it to recognize there was an issue. So I don't know. 
but I'm glad you asked. <laughs> uh, other thoughts on the Z order? Okay, uh, let's see, let me jump back here. Now, I, I have no reason to do this other than to just show you guys the grouping. And because this was a, this is a feature that I have no need to have in this game, but it's a feature that I would like to have in other games. So I thought I might as well build it. I have added a sequence system over here on the right. And the sequence system will process sequence components. And sequence components are just going to count through uh, a sequence of numbers, any sequence of numbers. So if I want to create paths or um, uh, acceleration curves or anything like that and apply them to any property on any component in any entity, I can use this one class to do it. So all I have to do is construct the sequence and stick it in here. So as long as I can construct the sequence, I can put it anywhere in my game on anything. So just as uh, all I have right now is a proof of concept, but I was so pleased with it, I want to show it. So in here we have the I enumerable sequence and it gets, I, I have this uh, I sequence component because uh, ignore that I probably don't need this. I was still kind of fiddling around with the, the design, but they have uh, an advanced method and that's just going to say, go give me the next number. They have a repeat forever property and a repeat count properties to, you know, give me a few options and then an apply and apply is special because it's the guy who knows how to take that number and stick it in any of the properties on the other components. Say, for example, I have a sequence that goes from zero to 255. Do I want that to be the X position of my text or do I want it to be the alpha channel to make it go transparent? It has no idea how to do that just being a set of numbers. So this method will tell it how to do that, what it's gonna do with that number. And it needs to know its association with another component to do that application. So we have a component input and then we have the value of the, the sequence, the current value of the sequence, and those will be passed to the apply method. And the apply method will do uh, 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 closure on it. And so I have one of those here. So I create a debug text entity. Uh, uh, did the wrong keys here, there we go. Uh, the debug text entity components is going to get this new sequence component. Uh, I have to have that entity first to add the components to it because I do this entity dot from up here, uh, whatever. So I create a, uh, an enumerable from zero to 50 and I just transform it into a float right here. And then I stick on the end of that, the same enumerable in reverse. And so it's gonna go from one to 50 and then from 50 to, sorry, zero to 50, then 50 to zero. And if it repeats forever, it's just going to go back and forth, if that if you can visualize that. And so you've seen this before. I go and I set its associated component to the ID of this guy, the actual text. And so now that I have him, he knows what this text component is going to be. He's going to has the uh, system is going to go and find that in the components collection of the entity. And this is the magical part that tells it what to do with that value. We're gonna take the dot position X property and assign it the current float from that enumerable. And when I do that, I don't know if this is strictly necessary. I think that's all I need to do to make that work. Nope, I've missed something. Give me a moment. live demos and all that, right? There we go. And see how easy that was. So now I don't have to have this for each and then this second for each running around in my main game loop. I just declared an object and this stuff magically just happens on its own forever until I change the properties on those things to destroy them or change them or whatever I see fit. So I could make this thing run around in circles. I could make it 
do whatever I want just with that sequence that uh, I, I started getting giddy just thinking about what those, what I could do with those sequences. Uh, uh, size, location, angles, any of that can be manipulated with those things. And so, of course, this is, you know, the game itself is still running the whole time that text is fooling around down there. So uh, some of those individual aspects may not be impressive on their own, but it gave me enough to build an entire game. And uh, other games may have different requirements, but I built this one with what? Just uh, how many systems? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I don't think I'm using all seven. Yep, I'm not even using this one anymore. So with six systems, I was able to build a game. So uh, that, that, that tells me it's pretty capable. <laughs>